Five, issued an executive order creating the Governor's Council on Climate Change, also known as the GC3. Uh, the Council is charged with examining the efficacy of existing policies and regulations designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and identify new strategies to meet the state's greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. The Council is composed of 15 members from state agencies, quasi-state agencies, businesses, nonprofits. To learn more about the GC3, please go to www.ct.gov slash deep slash GC3. The webinar series explores innovative and successful climate change solutions in Connecticut and across the country. This series will provide firsthand accounts of high profile municipal climate programs, climate initiatives in the corporate world, greenhouse gas reporting frameworks, statewide sustainability programs, and low carbon fuel initiatives. Today, we're excited to have as our presenter Shannon Davis, co-leader of the West Coast Climate and Materials Management Forum, and Kristen Brown, Vice President of Waste Zero. The West Coast Climate and Materials Management Forum is an EPA convened collaboration of state, local, and tribal governments that develop ways to institutionalize sustainable materials management practices. Waste Zero is focused on cutting trash in half across the United States by designing and managing pay-as-you-throw programs that save towns money and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Both presentations will focus on leading strategies for reducing greenhouse gas emissions by improving the way you manage and use materials. Uh, their presentation will be about 40 minutes long, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please submit your question in the question dialog box on your screen, and we'll read it aloud for our guests to respond to at the end. Uh, we'll have uh, Chris, Kristen present, or yeah, actually Shannon present first, uh, and then we'll have a slight transition in the slides because they're located in two different locations, uh, and then Kristen will present, well, then we'll open it up for questions. Um, and then before we get started, for those of you listening to your computer speakers, if you're experiencing poor sound quality, I do encourage you to call in using your telephone. Um, and with that, Shannon um, and Kristen, thank you again for your willingness to present. And I'll turn it over to Shannon for you to start. Great. Uh, thanks, Carrie. Can you hear me? Yep, sounds great. Great. Good morning, everyone from the West Coast. We're a little after nine here. And first, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Connecticut's Department of Environmental Protection, uh, Protection and the Governor's Council on Climate Change for giving me the opportunity to present some really exciting climate change work that's happening out here on the West Coast. Um, I've spent most of my public service career, about 25 years of it, in policy and environmental management. And for many of those years, I measured and monitored and cleaned up pollution. Um, but when I came to EPA um, and started to co-lead um, the West Coast Forum, um, I'm, in the I'm in the place where I actually get to work on um, presenting some of it. So here's an overview of what I want to go through today. And my apologies up front. This is a really, this is a speed date um, with climate and materials. So um, uh, just hang on, here we go. So I'm going to give a short introduction to the uh, forum out here. And then I want to give a very short history of materials, why we look at materials. I want to make the distinction between materials and discards then connect uh, materials to climate and talk about some of the um, tools and practices um, that we have to share with you. So as Carrie said, the West Coast Climate Forum um, is convened by EPA. Um, we're a collaboration of state, local, and tribal governments. And what we offer is a webinar series, research summaries, and toolkits to support our mission. But I think the most important point to make about the forum is all of the work of the forum that I'm going to share with you today has been developed primarily through our state and local partners. Our partners come to the table and vote with their feet, meaning um, we collectively decide what we want to work on, and then we work on that. And so these products are driven by um, the needs of state and local governments. So let's start with what are materials. And for this presentation, the term materials includes everything from raw materials to products consumed by individuals and governments. So materials could include, for example, sand used for roadways, concrete, 
our ubiquitous cell phones, food, office supplies, and packaging. And over time, um, we've dramatically increased our consumption of materials um, in America. And we Americans use and consume over 10 tons of products and resources per person each year. So you did hear correctly, 10 tons of products and resources per person each year. So um, mining and producing materials for consumption takes tremendous energy. As you know, we're a fossil fuel-based economy, and so burning that fossil fuel to produce materials produces greenhouse gases, and that's uh, in part what we want to explore today. So in 2009, um, EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, um, got together a stakeholder group and um, wrote this document, which you can easily find online, Sustainable Materials Management, The Road Ahead. And what this did for the field was it shifted the paradigm from managing waste to managing materials. And if you want to dive into it, it's fascinating. We examined 480 materials, products, and services. They were run through lenses of 14 environmental indicators. And what this report showed us is what the high impact materials, products, and services are. And that's been very helpful in identifying the kinds of materials we want to work with to reduce the embodied energy or the fossil fuels that it takes to make them. Um, this is the working definition, um, and it's, it's very nerdy. Uh, materials management is approach to using and reusing resources most efficiently and sustainably throughout their life cycles. It seeks to minimize materials used um, and all associated environmental impacts. And before materials management, we, we looked at our work primarily when you view this chart here, the life cycle wheel, we were spending a lot of time at end of life recovery. And I want to emphasize this early and often in my presentation that we love, love, love recycling. Um, the um, information um, that Kristen is going to present after me is really, pay, we love pay as you throw. It's a great incentivized program. But what we um, wanted to do was to use the whole life cycle to see um, where we could reduce greenhouse gas emissions throughout the life cycle. So for steel, life cycle looks like this, and all, all materials follow a similar life cycle. So, um, and generally, the impact of producing materials is the largest contributor over the life cycle. So um, for steel, you, it's resource extraction. For food, which is a huge, has huge environmental impacts, um, resource extraction is equivalent to the growing phase for food. So um, materials management is an effort to shift the focus to the entire life cycle in order to achieve the largest environmental benefits. So this is just a different representation of the steel life cycle, if you will. But just imagine an aluminum can being made in this image. First you would mine the bauxite, and then you'd process the bauxite and manufacture your favorite soft drink can. And then you would shop and consume your soda, and then you would put the can out in the blue bin for recycling. And at each stage here, there's an opportunity to evaluate um, what the GHGs are and come up with interventions. And here um, is um, the last chart with uh, discards and materials. And as you see, um, using this table, the, 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 goals, the goals are different with materials and discards. Discards is a part of materials management, um, the end of life. And then there's the life cycle stage, what what is accounted for upstream versus all life cycle phases. And one thing I want to point out, you know, the partners are really different. We've been, um, w with discards manage management, you have waste generators, the industry, um, 
users of recovered materials, um, as well as those of us who recycle. And, but the partners in materials management, everyone involved in the life cycle of materials, and every time the West Coast Forum picks a project to work on, we end up with kind of a surprising new um, field of partners. So as I've said, the primary purpose of the forum's work is to expand the greenhouse gas reduction options that are available to practitioners and policymakers. And now that you have the background or the shift from discards to materials, let's explore reducing greenhouse gas emissions from that perspective. Okay, so this is a really text-heavy, messy um, slide, and it's almost purposeful. It's, it's the why and the how greenhouse gases are measured. And I think it's really important to step back and reflect on why and how we measure greenhouse gas emissions. Um, climate change has become a prominent conversation in the press, uh, government, business, and the community level. And as you all are aware, it's not only a science, um, but it's also it's a bellwether of our times, um, you know, politically, socially, and economically. And you know what 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 we measure matters, um, and it gives us what we want to talk about. So how you measure determines the kinds of stories you want to tell. And what's important here is that there's no one way or right way to measure unless it's reported, uh, required reporting. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is an approach that can complement more traditional approaches. Um, and traditional approaches, I mean the kind that we use to measure what's coming out of our smokestacks and tailpipes. Okay. So a few slides ago, I talked about the road ahead and how we got, we made the shift from discards to materials. And about the same time the, um, the road ahead was published, EPA published this report also, easily found online. And the purpose was to um, better understand and improve the connection between materials and greenhouse gas emissions. And this report is, provides the foundation for a lot of um, the empirical work that the forum has done, but it has also provided a lot of foundations for state and locals who want to take a materials management approach um, and put, them in, put those approaches in their solid waste planning, their climate action plans, or their sustainability plans. All right, let's do a couple of uh, pie charts now. So um, this chart here is a 2006 U.S. inventory of greenhouse gases compiled by EPA. And you can see from this chart that the generation um, of electrical power, uh, transportation, and the industry sec sectors contribute the vast majority of the nation's GHG emissions. But um, we can't see materials in this chart, right? The only thing that we see is a waste wedge, uh, two percent, that comprise two percent. Waste comprises two percent of the emissions, but this two percent, right, doesn't account for the impact of producing the products. There's no, you can't see the impact of producing furniture or electronics or food, and that's because the greenhouse gas impacts of materials are spread throughout every category of this chart. And so it makes it really difficult to understand the environmental implications of our material consumption patterns. So EPA decided to take another look at how these emissions are categorized. And I'm going to flip to the next slide, but just want to stress that the same data are used for, for this chart and the chart that we're going to next. So you'll notice in this chart that the provision of goods and food contributes 42% of the nation's GHG emissions. So there are materials. And you'll see that the transportation of people and energy use in our buildings still contribute about half, but the significance of our material consumption dramatic, dramatically changes from one chart to another. 
So um, let's see. Let's go to the next one and put them side by side here. So the important thing is, is not necessarily to understand all the numbers behind it, although it's a fascinating story if you want to dive into the reports. But the power for and folks who are interested in policy levers and programs is that when we array the data differently, it gives us two different um, options of policy options, right? The, the chart on the left will um, give folks uh, more of a tailpipe smokestack um, reading. And then the chart on the right provides us ways to reduce the material impacts of climate change. And, and I think a good point to make here is the state of Oregon did a study some years ago, and they were looking at the most cost-effective ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And interestingly enough, it was the reduction of food waste, which was one of the most cost-effective ways. And the other thing when looking at these two charts as a policymaker or a program person is that you want to be looking at the one on the left because you want a um, energy portfolio that is less carbon intensive. You want buildings that are less carbon intensive, right? So you have an array of policy options there. And, um, you know, everybody is pretty much on that bus right now trying to figure that all out. But the pie chart on the right also shows where additional gains can be made and different um, policies and programs um, can, can be chosen. So when, when you're developing a sustainable materials management program, I just put down some <clears throat> excuse me, principles and policies that um, have helped us out here. And the first one is to view your impacts, actions, and connections across the life cycle throughout the orange wheel. And of course, recognizing that recycling conserves your resources and reduces pollution. But one of the most important things we found in so many studies is the environmental impacts, specifically the burning of fossil fuels, of production way upstream far outweigh the impacts of disposal. And the other piece, which I've mentioned before as an important principle, is to partner, partner, partner. Okay. This is just um, the home page of the West Coast Forum website. And uh, this website houses the resources and tools that our partnership has put together. They are free and available to the public. We invite you to steal shamelessly from it. And two things you might be interested in, um, you can find out, you can see right at the top of the page up there, um, you can check out the forum fact sheet, um, which has a lot of um, some of the uh, data that I've discussed today in sound bites. And then also one of our best um, educational tools, the annual webinar series. And that's going to be starting up again in April when we roll out our climate friendly purchasing toolkit, which I'll talk about. Um, so our first piece of work in the forum is we started downstream to see what was being put in landfills in California, Oregon, and Washington. So we analyzed the waste characterization studies and evaluated the content um, that was being uh, thrown away. And these are the four high impact materials um, identified in the report. Um, uh, carpet, uh, not only is carpet very energy intensive, but it gets thrown away often and at least in states that have landfills, it's, you know, it sits in landfills forever and ever. Food scraps, very high um, uh, energy, embodied energy in our food scraps. Core recyclables, aluminum cans, corrugated containers, magazines, newspapers, and then dimensional lumber. Um, and the forum has used this resource, this report, to help drive um, uh, some work more upstream. So the second thing we did was we built a climate action toolkit. And as you can see in the table of contents there, it um, goes through how to inventory, how to complement a traditional inventory with materials management, talks about measurement. And I think maybe one, two of the most important things here 
is it talks about actions and plans from it has specific uh, states and cities who've used materials management in their in their plans and I just wanted to toss this slide up I believe comes from Portland or Multnomah County and um, this is in, in the this climate action plan outlines um, their actions to reduce their um, greenhouse gas emissions and 46 percent of those are identified as materials, as you can see on the orange and red consumption and solid waste and food comprise 46%. The second toolkit that the forum built um, is a toolkit on how to reduce wasted food in the home. This is a uh, really a dynamite tool. And the great thing, this was built, I think, four or five years ago, maybe four years ago. And it's now going national, but it it um, has the NRDC report. You can see there the strawberries on it, and it um, gave us the unpleasant news that we waste uh, forty percent of the food from uh, farm to fork. And anybody in this business knows that organics um, in our landfills um, give off a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, and there's just a horrible waste that goes with it when we live in a world that has very high food insecurity. Out here in the West, our water usage is just inextricably tied to energy use. So we like to do the work where anything we can do to reduce um, food waste is going to reduce water and energy consumption. OK, so one of the issues, of course, that would come up in doing this work is the idea of sustainable consumption and what can be done. And um, the ideas or the principles that um, have been guiding us are to reduce the overall consumption and uh, or buy less and delay purchases, and shifting from higher in impact categories to lower ones, and shifting to better options. So to that end, this will be our next toolkit, um, which we're hard at work uh, putting together now. And we um, are going to provide an online tool for governments and academia to reduce their uh, footprint, if you will, through what they purchase. And what's really amazing is we looked at studies and found out that for an agency and, um, and government and universities, that purchasing is 35 to 55 percent of their footprint. So it represents this awesome opportunity to use your purchasing power to reduce your GHGs. And um, I'll walk through these icons with you. These will be the modules in the toolkit. Uh, the first one, um, going from left to right, the trends analysis will show you um, what are the high impact categories of about 50 jurisdictions that we surveyed. There'll be a how-to on how to conduct your own um, supply chain inventory. We have a module on food. Um, we're going to build out a construction module. We'll be focusing on asphalt and concrete. And if you remember going back to the road ahead, um, the number one um, envir high environmental impact um, product was sand and gravel, and number two was food. So to be able to tackle these and um, reduce the impacts of these uh, categories seems like we could really make a difference. Uh, the other ones, professional services, um, fuel on construction sites, and the last one is not a roll of paper towels. It's actually a roll of carpet. So we went back to that waste characterization report and knew we needed to do some work on carpet, and that's what that is. Um, real briefly, just a couple more upstream actions uh, to take a look at. You can look at green building, uh, numerous ways to look at that one, whether it's tiny houses, um, designing for deconstruction, um, or using the lead rating system. Another upstream action is uh, product environmental footprinting, which is basically akin to what is now required on our food labels. But uh, this, this label will tell you, uh, producers and purchasers, actually what's in things uh, from an environmental lens point of view. So when it comes to things like concrete, which so much is used 
um, when you buy it, a jurisdiction buys it, you could ask for an EPD nutrition label. So that's what I have for you. Um, please contact me with any information, any ideas. You want to join our mailing list. And now I'm going to turn it over. Thank you very much for your time today. And now I'm going to turn it over to Kristen. Thank you, Shannon. That was great. Uh, okay, we're going ahead and switching it over to Kristen. See her screen in just a moment. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Yep, you sound great. Uh, well, thank you, Shannon, for uh, putting together the link between climate change. I just want to tell you all that there is an audience here as well, so they're all going to be quiet, but I think we had a sneeze right at the beginning. So, um, Anyway, thank you again, Shannon, because uh, it's something that I think about all the time, the link between uh, materials management and uh, climate change. So you made that super clear for me, and I understand it better. So. I thank you for that, and I thank you, Connecticut, for inviting me to talk to you today. I'm excited to talk about the subject. Uh, it's, I think the, the program SMART is awesome. I'm going to use the word awesome a lot, I think, in this presentation for two reasons. One, because I just spent seven days with my son on vacation, and he uses it all the time, and I'm now addicted to it. And also because I would like, um, by the end of my talk, for everyone who's listening to also think that SMART is awesome and to look at introducing it in their own community. Uh, so I'll give you my quick background. I have been in this industry for about 25 years. I started with the largest recycler of waste paper in Europe. Uh, I was the bottom of the totem pole there, so I did a lot of market research in 17 different countries. We were looking for the magic bullet to recycling. Uh, we wanted to understand why some cities were doing really well, and then 20 miles down the road, another city with a similar demographic wasn't doing as well. Uh, so we did find a magic bullet in Europe. They call it the polluter pays principle. In the United States, we call it pays you throw, unit-based pricing, or in Connecticut, we call it smart. Uh, so what, what, we, what we found was in smart communities, cities and towns in Europe, as well as entire countries in Europe, if you had a smart payment model in place for residents, your per capita disposal of trash was about half that of a similar community or country that didn't have a smart model in place. So for instance, the country of Belgium, the entire country, every municipality has a pay-as-you-throw program or a polluter pays program, uh, and they disposed of half the, the per capita than France when at the time they had uh, no, uh, no smart programs. Uh, when I came back to the United States, I worked for a few different com companies. One of them, ICF, did the contract work for US EPA, so I did a lot of uh, outreach to uh, cities around the country about pay as you throw at the time. I also did a lot of research on hundreds and hundreds of communities that have pay as you throw. Uh, and throughout the research, I found similar findings to what we saw in Europe, and that is that uh, communities, no matter what the demographic, no matter uh, what the size, if they have a properly constructed smart uh, system, then they reduce or they, they throw away about half the per capita uh, as the communities that don't have that. Uh, so currently, I'm working uh, with Waste Zero as a consultant, and I'm working on a project for Deep in Connecticut. And we're hoping to move a few communities or many communities forward with SMART programs over the next couple of years. Uh, so the slide I have up there, SMART, stands for Save Money and Reduce Trash. Uh, basically, to me, the way I like to look at it is if you personally live in a community and you can save money if you reduce your trash, then you live in a SMART community. Uh, in Connecticut, there are very few SMART communities. Uh, there are a couple, Stonington being one great example, uh, but only a few, and they're, they're on the smaller side. So my goal over the next couple of years is to hopefully move some larger communities forward with SMART. Oh, down. oh that's the end, the last one. Sorry, guys. That's the second to last one. Okay. So this is just a, yeah, so that one, there we go. 
So just a quick look at Connecticut and your waste stream today. Uh, you're at about a 26% recycling rate where you've been hovering for a while. Your goal is a 60% diversion rate. Uh, you have about 41% of the trash uh, generated is coming from the residential sector. So those are residential homes, either six or four family attached and under. About 9% is coming from multifamily and about 23% coming from the commercial sector. Uh, so the good news is this, the smart strategy uh, can probably cut or bite into the blue part of the donut uh, and cut it maybe in half. Uh, Connecticut is unique. I've been told that quite a bit. Uh, and you are unique in that you still have a lot of subscription hall, uh, but you have about 63% of homes that are uh, controlled by the municipality either through their own collection crews or through uh, contracted haulers. But the good news is here that SMART can work in any of these systems. Uh, in Connecticut, basically people are paying for trash in two ways. You're paying through the tax base, uh, so residents don't really see the cost of trash. A lot of people consider it free or consider it, you know, their right to, to throw away as much as they want. Uh, you're also paying through, in, in those subscription communities, you're paying the hauler, and most times the hauler's charging the same amount per household, whether the household is throwing away a lot or a little trash. In Connecticut, you're doing a lot of promoting of recycling through municipal recycling coordinators, through cities, also through uh, DEEP. Uh, but, but basically, you're promoting it, you're not incentivizing it, and most communities have some basically unlimited trash. You have a 96-gallon container for your garbage or a 64-gallon container, or you basically can put out as many bags as, as you want, and it's generally still picked up. So the cost of trash is really, it, it's not a fair system. Uh, when you look at trash, the cost is going up. It's going up quicker than the CPI. So it's something that should be looked at a little bit differently, and that's what smart communities do. They look at it more like a utility. Uh, so for instance, with your electricity, if you go on vacation, you're gonna turn down your heat in the winter. Uh, if you leave the house, you're gonna turn off your lights, and you're gonna do that because you, you wanna save money. Uh, so the idea behind smart is, the smart approach is, is giving some incentive to residents to make that change. So you look at your tax base, you take a part of the cost of trash or potentially all of the cost of waste out of that tax base, you turn it into a per unit charge, which could be done through multiple container sizes, uh, official city bags or tags. And when you do that, this is why SMART is awesome, uh, when you do that, when residents realize that trash costs money, they completely change their behavior. Uh, they move more materials out of the waste stream, uh, out of that curb, and into the curbside recycling bin. Those are the commodity materials. They also do things like uh, take, uh, take their textiles and use toys to the goodwill. They do more backyard composting. They think out of the box if they have packing peanuts or something unusual, they take that back to Office Depot or they find an outlet for it because they don't want to pay any more for their trash. Uh, and that incentivizes uh, people to, to make, to look towards zero waste, to really just value and look at their trash differently. Uh, if you look back at the trend, uh, when we first started talking about recycling back in the 1970s, a lot has happened since then. Uh, we have curbside collection in most major cities. We've implemented single stream. Uh, we have recycling coordinators in most major cities. Uh, encouraging people to reduce waste. And after all of that action, uh, we still haven't managed to reduce waste all that much. Last year, we looked at Connecticut and we came up with an average of about uh, 847 pounds per capita that they're throwing away. Uh, but if you look at the neighbor, Massachusetts, where there are about 40% of communities, or a little over 40% of communities are doing pay-as-you-throw programs, uh, they're throwing away, in those communities, about 432 pounds per capita. So again, similar to my research in Europe, about half as much trash being thrown away in the communities that have a smart payment model. So 
So Massachusetts is awesome, uh, but so are a lot of the other states surrounding Connecticut. Uh, there's a lot of pay-as-you-throw programs in New York, uh, a lot in uh, Maine, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island. And also Vermont has uh, a mandatory statewide pay-as-you-throw, so there'll be more and more communities in Vermont. Hmm. Oh, okay. So this is looking at a couple of communities around uh, Connecticut. Uh, Waterville, Maine uh, started their pay-as-you-throw program about a year, a little over a year ago. Uh, I have this one up there just to demonstrate that the minute you move into a smart payment structure, uh, this is a weekly look, uh, the, the next week your trash drops uh, immediately because people take the time to read the directions. They look and they see, oh, I can recycle my peanut butter jar or I can you know, bring something to Habitat for Humanity. They look at their waste differently immediately. Uh, the next one is Malden, Massachusetts. I worked with them many years back. Uh, it's a uh, city outside of Boston. Uh, and this one sort of represents, you know, the length of time. It demonstrates that SMART, once you've done it, it stays in place. It also looks at those little blips within the years are monthly. So again, it's an immediate change when you move into a SMART structure. Uh, this next one is Stanford, Maine. Uh, it's one of my favorite examples. Uh, they're a community in Maine that started a uh, pay you throw smart program in 2010, so you can see the trash dropped dramatically. Uh, over a couple of months, uh, there was one individual who uh, actually won the Maine lottery, so he had some extra funds. He did not like pay as you throw, so he marketed and he was able to get it overturned. They went back to the old payment model, took it out. Uh, stayed that way for a couple of years. He finally moved to Florida about the same time. They had a, um, they were looking at their taxes, you know, do we want to increase taxes or what are we going to do? And they looked at, um, should we go back to the SMART system? And overwhelmingly the residents wanted to go back. They did and of course the trash dropped again immediately. So you can see that that price signal definitely uh, changes behavior immediately. Uh, the last one is Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, one of the oldest programs in New England, uh, you know, similar demographics to a lot of cities here in Connecticut. And they, they started their pay, pay as you throw in, program in 1994 and have been going strong ever since. Uh, a quick look at some of the work we did last year. We looked at 22 different cities in Connecticut. Out of those cities, we did spend ex an extensive amount of time with five of the cities, but this just shows you the green line across is that Massachusetts average. Uh, so I know that the neighbor can do as well as Massachusetts. We, we just have to uh, move a few of these communities forward and hopefully the others will, will watch and want to do it too. Uh, a little bit more on the trends and then I'll talk about the finances, but we took a detailed look at Bridgeport. You can see in 2011, 2012, uh, they implemented Recycle Bank. So they had a 48% increase in recycling. Um, and this is important to me because when you talk about percentage increases, a lot of it matters um, is, is where you start. So their recycling rate went up from 5.1 to 7.5%, which was um, an increase, but, but still not anywhere near the, where they need to be. Uh, they implemented single stream, had another increase in 2013. Uh, if they implemented a SMART program uh, with the proper rate structure, they would move um, to a, an increase of about 171% in recycling and about 44% decrease in trash. Uh, similarly, this is just a look at West Hartford. They have a much better recycling rate uh, than Bridgeport to start with. Uh, but it, again, if they moved into a smart strategy, they would increase, uh, increase their recycling considerably to the point where the two are almost um, the same. Now you can see that smart definitely reduces the trash, um, but how does it affect the residents? 
uh, and how much does it cost? Is it more, is it less expensive? Um, it actually costs the residents less money. Uh, so I'm gonna go through and try to explain. It's really just funding trash in a different way. So currently, uh, this is an example from West Hartford. Property taxes cover the cost of waste. Uh, waste disposal, it's uh, up close to $5 million, which equals about $250 per year per household on average. Um, if you look at uh, what happens with a smart structure, what West Hartford is looking at potentially doing is uh, moving into a bag-based program. And what would happen is instead of taking all of the cost uh, for, the, for the solid waste out of the tax base, only a part of it would come from the tax base. So the contribution basically per household would go down to about $128 per month. The remaining portion of the public works or the solid waste budget would be funded through the sale of a, an official trash bag. The average home will spend about $100 on those official bags. So the total in a SMART program for the household is about $228 as opposed to $250 on average. The remaining up top there, $518,000, is the savings because you're no longer, it's an avoided disposal cost basically. You're no longer throwing away as much material so you have an overall savings. So the overall cost of the, the solid waste system in West Hartford would come down by about 11% and the average home would save about $25. So it wouldn't be more costly, it would actually be less costly. Uh, it's a system that ends up being more fair to more people if you actually put the cost out, charted it um, in a bell curve, you'd see that about 85% of homes in a smart system will pay the same or less than they pay today, and only 15% would pay more. So actually not doing smart is costing residents more money when it comes to just isolating that, uh, the cost of solid waste. Uh, this is what we did is take uh, five, the five cities that we worked with in depth. We looked at their current situation. The average recycling rate was about 14%. Uh, we looked at what would happen if SMART was implemented. And you can see that there's a complete change in materials. Not only does the recycling rate go up on average and the waste um, come down, but there's also that missing material which is no longer handled by the city. Uh, and this is where you see source reduction from that behavior change. Uh, you see backyard composting, you see more reuse. So a lot of that is not, you can't account for it, you can't measure it, uh, but there is an added benefit to the city in that you no longer have to move those materials. So with waste and recycling, you're hauling them somewhere, and in a SMART program, you are moving less materials overall. Uh, and just a quick look at the overall uh, greenhouse gas benefits. I think the numbers that stand out to me are 212,000 cars off the road. It's interesting, that's about 7% of the registered cars in Connecticut. Uh, and then the solar panels. Basically, for every single family household, there could be one solar panel added per year. Uh, so that's the overall benefit based on the WARM model. Uh, so I've got three things to remember. Um, according to US EPA, uh, SMART is the single most effective way to reduce waste. Uh, a SMART payment model is more fair to more people than the current payment model. and all municipalities should consider SMART as part of their climate action plans. Uh, and SMART is awesome. And thank you. Great, thank you, Kristen, that was wonderful. We'll go ahead and leave your contact information up so that people can uh, write that down. Um, so, and thank you, Shannon, as well. Uh, that was really informative. Um, I do have some questions coming in, um, so I'll go ahead and kick off with a few, um, and then others, if you have questions, go ahead and submit them. Uh, so first question, um, so Shannon, you mentioned in your presentation a little bit about how, how, what the upstream greenhouse gas emission 
um, impacts are. Um, how as a consumer can I influence the upstream impacts of products that I buy? Can you give a few examples of decision-making process when, when purchasing products that we can start paying attention to those upstream impacts? Sure. Um, that's a great question. And the first resource I would uh, direct you to is called the Cool Climate Calculator. So just Google that. And a colleague of ours at Berkeley, um, Dr. Chris Jones, he and his team have developed this calculator that's based um, that's a consumption-based calculator. And the really cool thing about what Chris and his team have done is it is you can go in and you can put your zip code in, and it will tell you where your highest um, energy um, costs are, meaning not necessarily in dollars, but what you, um, according to your region, um, where your um, highest energy budget is, if you will. So if I wanted to do that out here in California, it would be transportation for sure. But the other thing, um, I think what's many of us who've worked with the forum have really thought about what's the answer to this. And it's not easy. It's very complicated. But I think that what a lot of us have done is just slowed down to look at what we buy and how we buy it and do we need it. And then I think another way to work with it is just to cho choose a specific area that you'd like to buy greener or buy more um, less carbon intensive and then do some research on that. So it can be clothing, it can be um, the car you drive, do you buy a new one or not. And then the last thing I want to say is that in April or May, the Urban Sustainability Directors Network will be publishing a toolkit, um, sustainable consumption toolkit for um, cities to help them with it. Great, thank you. Um, a couple, a few more questions here. Um, what is Connecticut doing to, and I know Jennifer Wayman is on the phone too, so it might be appropriate for her to answer this, but um, what is Connecticut doing to reduce food waste um, and what are other states doing? Hi, this is Jennifer Wayman. Thanks, Carrie, for putting me on the spot. Um, we, no worries. We are um, working with the Harvard Food Policy Law Clinic to develop some fact sheets on how to uh, um, work within our legal system uh, to prevent food waste and to make sure that it's, it's donatable. Working on liability, tax incentives, and labeling. Um, and then we also have our law. You want, to, you want to speak? Yes, and we also have a recently passed law which requires large-scale generators of organic, so uh, food processors, grocery stores, if you're generating two tons a month, to divert that um, organic waste to a facility as capacity becomes available. And there's a, a requirement that when capacity is available within a 20-mile radius of the generating facility, that generating facility must divert the waste. That was Robert Eisner, Director of uh, Waste Engineering and Enforcement Division. Great, thank you. And is there any municipalities in Connecticut currently uh, composting? Um, there are um, a few. There are communities that promote um, backyard composting. There's a few pilots going on. There's actually um, one community that's working on a food stupid waste program modeled after um, what Shannon was speaking about. Um, and there's a few uh, communities in the um, northwest region that are doing some curbside collection as well as uh, transfer station collection of food scraps. Um, and then we also have, um, oh, all of our leaf composting. Um, uh, we have a leaf registration, um, and, and all the communities in Connecticut do um, some sort of leaf composting in their municipality. Great, thank you. Thanks for, for being able to be on the spot there. Uh, okay, a question here. News sources frequently report that the market for recycled materials is weak in several categories. How does this impact the cost and environmental impact of SMART? Uh, 
So the, you, I'm going to try to use my slides here and go back to something. Uh, one good thing is even if you are having to now pay a tip fee for recycling, uh, whereas maybe before it was zero or maybe you were getting paid, because there is this missing waste that the community still no longer handles, you still should have a positive um, financial impact. It should not be negative. Uh, even in Washington, D.C., where I've recently looked at their numbers, uh, they're paying $75 a ton for recycling right now, and I think it's only $42 a ton for trash. And even if they went to pay-as-you-throw and increased the curbside commodity materials, um, decreased the trash, they still would not end up paying more, even though the recycling costs more because of the source reduction. They're not saving nearly as much as they could if, if the numbers were reversed, but, um, but, but, it's, but SMART is still a financially um, viable option. Okay, can you please speak more to carpet, which was the number one um, highest impact um, in the F any efforts, and also um, there was a request for the report, uh, which we will post on our website. Yeah, thanks for the question about carpet, and just, um, again, carpet was one of the 10 top materials identified in, in landfills, and there were two factors that determined how the materials ranking occurred. One was in terms of emission reductions, and what were the reduction potential of recycling carpet. And then second, um, and we use the WARM model to do that, the EPA tool. And then second factor was the overall tonnage. So um, that's how carpet um, was, was chosen. And again, it's, it's also one of those materials that jurisdictions get stuck managing, um, managing the discards to it. And I would also recommend, in addition to the report um, that, I've, uh, that will be posted, is to take a look at California has a carpet product stewardship law. I believe it's one of the only ones in America. Um, they're really struggling to make it work, but um, they're, as, as California does, they're first out of the gate. And um, I think the rest of us always learn from what doesn't work. Great, thanks. Um, another question, and, and Jennifer or Kristen, I think this is targeted at you. What are some common concerns that municipalities have when presented with a SMART program? So the number one question that I always get is, are we going to get illegal dumping? Um, which many studies have been done at this point, a lot of surveys. And for the most part, municipalities will tell you that illegal dumping doesn't really change. You have some illegal dumping before you start a program, and you're still going to have some illegal dumping after. Uh, but those that try to measure it carefully and really monitor it find that there's not much change at all. Um, they, they ticket people. They try to find out, you know, for instance, if a bag is thrown on the side of the road, they go through it and try to find out where it came from. And when residents know that they're being monitored, um, it, it does not seem to be a problem. Uh, so that's my, I, I guess the biggest, the, the, uh, the question we get most frequently, and I would say the biggest fear, especially in a place like Connecticut, is that trash has always seemed free to residents, and it is difficult to make that change. Uh, so that, that would be, I think, the, the largest hurdle that we have to get over. Uh, looking at the fact that right now the system is not fair to most people because most people are recycling well or recycling some and there are few people that are not and those people that are doing the right thing are subsidizing the behavior of those that are not so the current system is not fair um, but it is hard to, to change that mindset and take the cost of trash you know out of that tax base on some level um, so that's, that's the biggest hurdle we get. Okay. Um, how many, I don't know if you know how many, but uh, what, do you have a sense of how many states or cities in the U.S. have moved to the SMART model? Are we seeing this as a major trend? 
So, yes, a major trend. I think we've been doing it for quite a long time. West Coast cities are ahead. Like you mentioned, California is ahead. Uh, California does not have mandatory pay-as-you-throw, but I believe almost all municipalities have pay-as-you-throw in place, so much so that they don't even really call it pay-as-you-throw. It's just what you do. Um, so you, you have uh, a few states that have mandatory pay-as-you-throw, Washington, Oregon, Minnesota, Vermont now. Um, Rhode Island is, is – uh, has one landfill, so I know they're looking at a uh, statewide pay-as-you-throw uh, program through their Rhode Island Resource Recovery, uh, which runs the landfill and the, um, and the resource recovery. Uh, so definitely the trend. Massachusetts uh, has been moving forward with it for quite some time. They have four or five uh, people uh, that work for the Department of the Environment that focus on waste reduction and They've always told me that their, you know, biggest tool is moving people into page and throw or smart. And I'd just like to say that Kristen is going to be working with another 10 communities um, this year, this spring. Um, and so if there are any municipalities on the call today interested in being one of those communities, please either contact her um, on the with the contact information on the screen or contact me, um, jennifer.weymouth at ct.gov. Um, and in addition, we have grants available to municipalities who are interested in moving forward with unit-based pricing or um, pays you throw. Great. Uh, a couple more questions and then we'll, we'll sign off. Um, does recycling contamination increase when SMART is adopted? And if so, is this a problem? Uh, and so there haven't, there, there haven't been any formal studies that I know of yet. I only know what I hear from different municipalities and also from waste management. So, so one of my friends at waste management uh, feels that in pay you throw communities, there's actually less contamination. And, you know, that's, this is a personal opinion, I think, as to why. Um, his opinion was that people actually read the directions and they know they're not supposed to put the plastic bags in there. And, you know, they just... They, they think about recycling differently, so um, that could be a factor. Uh, as far as actually converting, you, you have a lot of contamination regardless, and I just not have, I have not heard from really any municipalities that it's worse in, in pay as you throw communities. Okay, um, and Kristen, do your figures for GHG reduction from SMART assume reduced numbers of MSW trucks on the road, reduced load trucks, or, or both? So I believe it does not. I believe that through the WARM model, it's only calculating, I don't think it's calculating the transportation into it. I think it's just the waste reduction. Okay. I, I'm not 100% sure. Okay, and then the last think, question. Oh, go Shannon ahead. Might, Shannon might know the answer to that better than me. If I put the numbers through WARM, what, what is that including? You know, I, I couldn't be specific enough to help you out. Okay, that's right, something we can look into. Um, and then the last question is um, actually here at, at um, Connecticut Deep, we hosted um, Oregon's consumption-based accounting uh, methodology a few months ago, and you know the materials management piece is, is, was impressive. Um, are there other states taking into account the full life cycle of, of um, their GHGs from their materials consumption besides Oregon? Yeah, yeah great question. So King County, which is home to Seattle, did a consumption-based emissions inventory about the time that Oregon did. Um, the city of San Francisco has also completed that. And then um, in, a, in a just a um, really terrific piece of work that was done recently, the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area Air Quality Management District did a consumption-based emissions inventory for the eight or nine jurisdictions in the Bay because the air quality organizations here in California are, um, with others, are largely on the hook for GHG reductions vis-a-vis uh, -vis the climate change bill that Schwarzenegger passed when he was governor. And you can only reduce emissions so much in the traditional approach, so they're now looking at consumption-based emissions inventory and that's air quality doing that. So that's very exciting. It's in another part of the environmental field. 
Great. Well, that's all the questions we have for you today. And again, we want to thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, and we will we will post the presentation online for um, for those folks who would like to watch it again or pass it on to others who were not able to attend. Um, we can also put their PowerPoint presentations up if that's okay with Shannon and Kristen. Um, and we'll provide some additional links to some of the resources that they um, went through on the webinar. Uh, our next webinar, we, we are about to release the date or the uh, announcement of the, um, the presentation. It is March 23rd at noon. Um, we'll be looking at TravelWise, which is a Utah uh, transportation program. Um, further details will be, um, as I said, um, released soon. So thank you again, everyone, for um, participating in today's webinar, and uh, um, we'll be in touch. Thanks. Bye.